I'm your host, Deborah Foreman, the Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus. And I'm joined today by Aaron, Dr. Aaron Boster, who's here today to answer all your questions. Once I introduce him, we'll open it up to your questions and comments. So Dr. Aaron Boster is a board certified neurologist specializing in multiple sclerosis and related CNS inflammatory disorders. He decided to become an MS doctor at age 12 as he watched his uncle, Mark, suffer from the disease in an era before treatment was available. Dr. Boster grew up in Columbus, Ohio and attended undergraduate at Oberlin College. He earned his MD at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and completed an internship in internal medicine and residency in neurology at the University of Michigan. He then completed a two-year fellowship in clinical neuroimmunology at Wayne State University. Since then, Dr. Boster has been intimately involved in the care of people impacted by multiple sclerosis. He has been a principal investigator in numerous clinical trials, trained multiple MS doctors and nurse practitioners, and been published extensively in medical journals. He lectures to both patients and providers worldwide with a mission to educate, energize, and empower, and those are all capitalized, people impacted by MS. He lives in Columbus, Ohio with his wife, Chrissy, son, Maxwell, and daughter, Barry, Mer Betty May. Love that name. Doctor, thank you so much for being here today. And I'm going to turn it over to you and we'll see what kind of questions come in. Fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. Um, you you um, participate in an awesome organization and it's so cool tonight that we're gonna do this Q&A. So, Let's kick it off. Um, I, I want to say hello, howdy, hi to all the people on the interwebs, or as one of my patients says, the little people that live inside my computer. And I am super excited to engage in a conversation. So let's get going. I'm sure we're going to get some interesting ones today. Let's see. Okay. So um, this is actually a, a question that came in prior to the meeting. And that was really nice that people actually thought to do that. If your current neurologist has not ordered any MRIs in over two years, is it time to take a, a new look for a new one? I guess she's meeting a new neurologist. So it's my opinion that we want to monitor your disease. And I monitor disease three ways. The most important is what you tell me because you're a U expert. So I figure if I listen to you, you'll tell me about what's going on. And the second most important way is a toss up between what I call the MS Olympics, you know, when we do all this kind of stuff, and then also the MRI. And it's my opinion that there's a best practice in MS to obtain an MRI of the brain once a year. That's my strong opinion. And it's also the opinion of the National MS Society um, and other, you know, international organizations like the International MS Federation. So, you know, I would start maybe by having a conversation with your neurologist and saying, hey, neurologist it's my brain and it's my insurance money. And I would love to get an MRI of the brain because it would make me feel more comfortable. And it would be my hope that your neurologist would say, okay, if your neurologist was disinclined, it might be a good idea to make sure that you can get that scan elsewhere. Um, you know, I want to remind you that it's your brain and your body. Uh, and, and if you want to take a look, I think that you're allowed. Absolutely. And thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I've heard it said that there is no need for seniors with RMS to be on disease modifying treatment medications. I am 72 years old. Is this true or why, and why? So no, it is not true. Now I will share with you, there is a raging debate amongst MS neurologists today about the, the age at which we no longer need to treat. And I am very biased as I talk with you. I have a very strong opinion, and I have been practicing this way since I started MS Neurology, that I refuse to treat people after death. So after death, I will not apply any therapies. However, pre-death, if you have a nervous system with functions that you like, for example, uh, seeing or smelling or orgasming or wiggling your ears, whatever the nervous system that you like. I want you to maintain that. I want you to preserve the reserve. And one of the best ways we do that is by applying medicines. So I think it's inappropriate to stop medicine because you've reached a certain birthday. Now it is true that as we age in our seventh and eighth decades of life, the immune system can quiet down. 
And whereas I am diametrically opposed to stopping medicines wholeheartedly, I think there, there is a role for de-escalation where we may put you on a medicine that has a, a more favorable side effect profile. Um, thank you for asking that question. And Kellyanne would like to know, uh, what's the difference between relapsing, remitting and progressive relapsing? Just words. So, so you know, human beings love taxonomy. We like, to ident we like to put things in boxes and describe them. And neurologists are particularly fond of that. And so in the 60s and 70s, we tried to define MS phenotypically, meaning what it looks like. So some patients would have an event where they would lose a function and then they would gain it back either partially or fully. And, and we would call that event an attack or a relapse. And then there would be a period where if you weren't paying attention, it looked like everything was stable. And so they borrowed a term from cancer, relapsing, remitting. And there are other patients where they have a slow progressive decline in function with no attacks, and we call that primary progressive. And then there are other patients that may have some attacks and then progress. And so there was a time when we made up all these terms chronic progressive relapsing, et cetera. I think it's a bunch of hogwash actually, because it's, an, it's a very, very cursory outside observation. It's, dare I say, as useful as calling someone a quote, buxom blonde, end quote, a term I do not like. In this example, that doesn't tell you anything about the human except two outward features that don't really define them. I look forward to the future where we redefine MS properly based on the immunology and the genetics. For right now, I would submit to you, Kellyanne, that there's two kinds of MS that I wanna be thinking about, relapsing forms of MS and progressive forms of MS. Simple, very, very useful in my clinic. And thank you for that question. What are the latest developments on repairing old damage, remyelina remyelination? Is there anything we can try now, even in the right to try or expanded access or compassionate use programs? So this question is, is getting at the future of MS. And there are several investigations ongoing studying hopeful agents that might become the next best thing. Something that might remyelinate, put the myelin back on the nerve or and be neuroprotective, help prevent the accelerated brain volume loss, the shrinkage of the brain. And humbly, today, we have nothing that we can offer outside of some clinical trials. I will share with you that there is an international thrust exactly in this area of going beyond just treating with anti-inflammatory medicines like we have available. And it's my hope that we will see a remyelinating agent within the next eight to 10 years. Now, is there something you can do in the now? Absolutely, there is something you can do in the now. What can you do? the very best measures that we have to protect your brain, to allow your brain to age naturally and to preserve the neurologic reserve are behavioral. So avoiding tobacco smoke, avoiding smoking things, um, drinking in moderation and a, a focusing, excuse me, on cardiovascular risk factors, controlling high blood pressure, cholesterol, these are not namby-pamby things. These have been demonstrated to slow disability in MS and to slow brain volume loss in MS. Exercising as part of your lifestyle is a key element to maintaining brain volume, right? And so those lifestyle things that your mom thinks is a good idea, she's right. And if you adhere to them, it will slow your progressive decline. And so there are things that you can do in the now. The medicines will come and we're working on them, I promise you. Wonderful, thank you. Madura has asked, how long would the effect of Lumtrata last? Should it take it? Should I take it every year, or is it once a lifetime? So this is a question about one of my preferred disease modifying therapies, a drug alemtuzumab, codename Lumtrata, which is a it, it's a drug that's given in a weird way. It's because you give it for five days and then you don't do anything the rest of that first year. Then you give it for three days, and then you don't give it ever again unless there's new disease activity. So to answer your question, if we were to sit and talk in clinic, it would be my plan that we give you the five infusions, and on the anniversary, we give you the three infusions, and then we would observe and monitor. We would get MRIs once a year of the brain and the spine. I would bring you into clinic, 
four times a year so that we can do exams and listen to you talk about how you're doing. And if you're good in the hood and you're not having new spots on your MRI and your exam is stable like Mabel and you're not failing the litmus test of life, we're not going to retreat you. We're just going to celebrate. If God forbid you have breakthrough disease, we hit pause, evaluate. And in that reevaluation, we might opt to give you another three days of Lentrata, or we might opt to do something different. It's all about the monitoring. Now we have data in Lemtrada that goes out 10 years. So that's really helpful because we can look down the pike and see what's happened before us. And what we find is 55% of people that are treated with Lemtrada never need treated again. 30% of people with Lemtrada require a third course and 14% require um, a total of four courses. So you, you take one more. And so those are kind of the stats that I keep in my head. And it's an exciting way to consider treating MS. It's a bit different from most of the other, other therapies. Thank you for the question. And so with my neurologist being fully aware, I've been taking Benadryl to control neurological pain. After having MS for over 23 years, I wanna know why, isn't, why, why this isn't a go-to treatment and why it isn't more re referenced since there are many studies which show the benefits. And by the way, those studies span over 20 years. So, so Benadryl, which is an H2 blocker, is used to treat allergic reactions um, and allergies and things like that. Um, now, I, I just got a note from John Poling that we can barely hear each other. Um, do we have a sense of whether the, the, the recording is good? I don't know if people who are listening could type in if, if you can hear okay or not. I want to make sure that you're not just watching our lips move like this. You know, that would be annoying. Um, I can hear you loud right? and clear. So, I can too. Okay, super duper. I just want to make sure that, um, that we're doing okay. So with regards to Benadryl, Benadryl is a symptomatic medicine that I use wholeheartedly in the setting of giving people uh, infusions to minimize reactions. I am not familiar with the data that you are, are referencing that it can be used as a pain medicine. Now, I'm not proud, and if that helps your pain, I am delighted, and I am tickled that you and your doctor are talking about it and that it's working for you. That's fantastic. Um, I'll tell you what, my homework tonight is going to be to go jump into PubMed and try to find some of those articles that you mentioned, um, and that's what I'll be reading about tonight, so thank you for that. And Jen wants to know, can a common cold exacerbate symptoms? My spasticity has been awful for about one for about a week. And yesterday I woke up with a head cold. Could my body, could my body trying to fight off the cold cause symptoms to worsen? Spot on, 100 percent That's exactly correct. And we actually have a fancy pants term for that. We call that a pseudo exacerbation where you have a, a re-emergence of old symptoms, not because of a new attack, but because you short-circuited old damage because you have a cold. So sometimes my patients feel like they have superpowers. They can tell you something's wrong because they have a neurological symptom. And then we'll go searching and we'll find the urinary tract infection or what have you. So yeah, you're, you're absolutely doing a great job of reading your body. Good job. Whoops. Let's see. Let me go back to this. Hold on. I just lost it. Okay. Um, next question is, can you discuss Evashield? That has yeah, I can. It was just so, granted. So Evashield um, is a brand new therapy, literally, that uh, was, was kind of broadcast today. Uh, and so I learned about Evashield where I learned about a lot of breakthroughs uh, from my patient who called and said, hey, could I take this? And so I immediately had to kind of stop what I was doing and read up on it. Um, so I think it's very timely that you're asking that question. So Evashield is made by AstraZeneca, and it's a shot that you give yourself. And it's a one-time shot that is intended to prophylax against COVID. It's intended, it's not a vaccine. It's a, it's a monoclonal antibody that stays in your body for a really long time, and it's intended for people who have immune uh, suppression, because as we've learned in the MS space, certain immunosuppressants impair our ability to mount a vaccine response. 
I have patients that are taking good MS medicines, but unfortunately, because of that, they can't mount an adequate COVID vaccine response, which is terrifying. And so a medicine like this might be the answer. Maybe we can give them this long acting monoclonal antibody and provide a degree of protection. Now, I can't speak more granularly about it because I quite literally learned about it about like noon today, um, but I'm very excited. And you can definitely find a big splash on the interwebs this, this afternoon talking about AstraZeneca's new drug. I think you're a little frozen, doctor. Are you able to hear okay? Yeah. Testing, testing, one, you're, two, you're three, back. four. Okay, sorry guys. I promise I'm not running around. <laughs> okay, so is the new Evo Walk, which uses artificial intelligence, a better option, or does it work better than the Walk Aid or Bionis functional electrical stimulators? So the person is asking a rather technologically savvy question. So if we back up two steps, sometimes people with MS can develop weakness, which can mess up their walking. And one of the common weaknesses that we see is called a foot drop. So if this is my leg and this is my foot, the foot flops. And so it can catch on the ground and it can cause you to fall and, and it changes your walking in a bad way. So one way to take care of that is to put on what's called an AFO or an ankle foot orthosis, which is just a piece of plastic shaped like an L that cocks your foot up. And there's advantages and disadvantages. Now there's a more technologically cool way of taking care of the problem where you strap um, a device onto your leg, which shocks the muscle and causes it to fire and allows you to recreate normal gait mechanics. It's really cool. And uh, the, the, the person asking the question is asking, hey, which of the newest, latest, greatest ones are the best? And the way I like to answer the question is they're very expensive. And the vast majority of the families that I work with cannot afford them. And it's much to my chagrin because they're really, really cool. Um, I wish that they were covered by insurance. Um, and I wish that they didn't cost upwards of $5,000 because it makes it very challenging for the average American raising a family to have access to those. So, so I still spend a lot of time using an ankle foot orthosis or even other um, old school kind of analog devices. Now, if you are fortunate enough to be able to try them out, I think it's a very individualized answer. Some people gravitate towards a bio nest. Some people prefer a different device. And I think the best advice I can give you is to try them all out and see which one works better for your body. Great question. Dr. Ann would like to know, what are the different types of MRI machines? So the MRI machine is a giant, giant magnet. And when you hear the MRI machine go bang, 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 what it's doing is, is it's turning the magnet on and letting it turn off, letting it turn on and letting it turn off. And when it turns on, it makes all the protons stand at attention. And then when you turn it off, the protons relax. And the protons relax in fat slower than in water. And so the relaxation time is how we create the pictures of the MRI. Now, all the MRIs that you're familiar with all use that same technology. Quote, different MRIs have to do with the strength of the magnet. And Magnetic strength is measured in a, a unit called Tesla. So a, a, a Tesla is the strength of the magnet. And the standard community scanner is a 1.5 Tesla, which is not adequate in my personal opinion. I much prefer to use a 3T magnet. Now, that's not a different kind of magnet. That's just a more potent magnet. And we wanna make sure that the protocol used is the right protocol. Now, sometimes patients ask me if they can please have an open MRI because they're claustrophobic, as am I. And whereas the idea of being in an open scanner sounds better, the picture is abominable. It's very poor quality. And if we're gonna take a picture of the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, I need a really good picture. And so it's my strong preference to image you on a traditional 3T scanner. My favorite is, um, made by Siemens, the, that manufacturer. 
And if you are claustrophobic, there's all kinds of maneuvers and tricks and tips and medicines that we can use to get you in the scanner safely. So hopefully that helps answer the question. Thank you. Um, Kelsey would like to know, does relapsing MS always turn into progressive MS? If not, what's no. the so, so no, it does not. And the biggest determinant is disease modifying therapy. So I want you on the most effective disease modifying therapy that you're comfortable taking. And I want you on it as early as we can get you on it. And that is the very best we can do to slow or prevent the onset of secondary progressive MS. Thank you. Medora would like to know, are there any biomarkers for inflammation? There's many. So two of the biomarkers that are kind of traditional in our field is the presence of oligoclonal bands or OCBs seen on a spinal tap. So the evidence of OCBs on a spinal tap suggests an overly active immune response or inflammation in the central compartment. Another traditional tool that we use is the MRI looking at contrast enhancement. So when you go in the scanner and they pull you out of the gantry and they inject your arm with the stuff that makes you feel like you're gonna pee your pants and you feel all warm, that's the dye. And when they put you back in the gantry and the machine starts up again, bang, 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 it's taking a picture. And if we see contrast enhancing lesions, that tells us there's inflammation in the noggin. Now we're developing a very exciting technology called neurofilament light chain. And that's a blood test now, which allows us to look at inflammation in the brain. And it's not prime time yet. It's still being developed in research, but I think we're going to have it commercially in a couple of years. And that will be the very first viable serum biomarker to measure MS disease activity. I'm very excited for it. Nice. Remy would like to know, he said, my question is not specifically medical, but how do people such as I who suffer from MS continue to maintain a forward atmosphere whenever financially you're extremely limited and now due to COVID employment is almost impossible? I have noticed certain parts of my financial aspect falling under the wayside, such as car payments or rent now that I am unable to work. So, so, so I don't have a all seeing, all knowing, all dancing solution that I would like to present. Um, I, I, I empathize with you and I recognize that the world has been literally flipped upside down. Um, all of our lives have been literally flipped upside down there are some potential silver linings. And if you are on this chat, it means that you have an internet connection at your house and that you must have a peripheral device to use that internet connection. Increasingly, we are finding uh, people that are finding gainful employment in their living room, working remotely from home in multitudes of capacities. And so I think it requires a bit of paradigm shifting to, to be able to kind of think about what you might be able to do for a career from home. But I, I do think more than ever, we're, we've realized that the old HR concepts of must be at work from nine to five are simply not true. Um, we at the Boster Center for MS take great pride in the fact that we create a flexible work environment for our team members and our employees. Um, and some of them work from home several days a week because they're parents and they need to be at home. And so I would encourage you to think outside the proverbial box and ask yourself, is there something that I might be able to do using the computer connection that you're using to listen to me right now? Right. And I'd like to add something um, be, that not everybody here knows about, but we do at the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation has an emergency assistance program for those situations where your, your electric's being shut off, your, your gas is being shut off, your, you know, you're being evicted, things like that. We try to help with that. Um, try not to get to the point where tomorrow it's being shut off. You know, just before that, come to us and maybe we'll be able to help if they qualify and they fill out the application correctly and all of that, we do try to help people with that. So, and there are other organizations that can help with those things. So, you know, go to those MS advocate organizations and see if they can help you if you get to the point where you really are having difficulty. 
And let's take a moment and highlight that amazing thing that you just said, because wow. So here's an organization that is that is at the ready to try to help you in that situation. And so let, let me just say thanks to, to, to MSF. That's a really big deal. I, I also will piggyback off what you said and said, I've written many letters. Um, so in Ohio, it gets pretty hot in the summer. And I've had situations where someone was going to have their electricity turned off, which would be paramount to them melting. And so we write a letter and say, hey, listen, I understand that they're late on their bill, but medically necessary to maintain their air conditioning. And so we write a letter of medical necessity. And at least um, in my experience, we've been very fortunate that the, that the electric company says, okay. And so you could also lean on your MS neurologist to help with some of that. Absolutely. Good. Okay. So Nicole says, what would you say to doctors who tell patients pain is not associated with MS? What are I would say they're full of shit. Yep. What are your suggestions for folks dealing with pain? So forgive my foul language, but that's it's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, so, so I know that MS hurts because I watched my uncle suffer and hurt. So I knew that long before I became a doctor. And I'll tell a quick story. I went to University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, which is a decent med school. And during my first year of med school, we had a lecture on MS and I'm sitting in a room with 180 med students taking notes. And the professor said what you just said, MS doesn't cause pain. And I stood up and said, sir, MS causes pain. And he said, sit down, you're wrong. Well, I'm now considered an MS specialist. And so I can tell you with great authority, nah, -uh, MS hurts. And in fact, I've made innumerable YouTube videos on the myriad of ways that MS can hurt. In fact, MS has very unique forms of pain. Lermite's phenomenon, optic neuritis, trigeminal neuralgia, I can go on for quite some time. If your MS neurologist or if your neurologist fails to see that, I'm sorry. And on behalf of doctors, allow me to apologize to you. I now encourage you to recognize that it's your disease, it's your body, and frankly, it's your pain. And if the person that you're partnering with isn't a good listener, Maybe you need to find someone else who will be a good listener. We're not talking about using narcotics. We're not talking about becoming addicted to pills, but we're talking about alleviating discomfort so that you can live a more meaningful life. And I encourage you to feel confident in that. You're not nuts. It does cause pain and it is treatable. Thank you for asking that. That was a great answer. Um, Jean says there's been a lot of talk about the effect of various DMTs on COVID vaccinations. Has anyone looked at the effects of say tetanus, which masks and social distancing do not help? And it has a 10 to 30% mortality rate. So, so right now there is an increased focus on immunology surrounding COVID for very obvious reasons. Um, there isn't an up a surge of information uh, on tetanus because Tetanus uh, toxoid works very, very well. And, and we, we have integrated into the fabric of the American culture, tetanus vaccines and so on and so forth. So, so it's not something that you see very much about. Now I'm a nerdy uh, immunologist and I think that stuff is fascinating, um, but I'm very, very delighted that it works really, really well when you take those tetanus vaccines. Okay. So Richie, says with all the money donated, why is there not a cure yet? My wife does not deserve this horrific disease. And um, Casey, I believe has an answer she'd like to give also, but I'd like you to. Absolutely. Casey, would you like to go first or shall I? I'll interpret your silences. Go ahead, Aaron. you can start. I, I'm sorry, I was just unmuting. Um, no I, go ahead, I, Casey. I just wanted to um, say, um, you know, the MS community as a whole is passionate about finding a cure that um, I'm sure Dr. Bosser will touch on the research that is going into that. Um, but I do want people to distinguish um, when we're talking about donations that their donations actually impact more than just research for a cure. For example, the program that Deborah just mentioned about emergency financial assistance or our home care program, um, programs that help people pay for their doctor's visits, a lot of donations are funding what people with MS need 
uh, to live through today with this condition until that cure is found. Um, so I think that's just something that's important for people to keep in mind. Again, highlighting the amazing work that you guys do. Um, I, I love interacting with you because it's such an impactful organization uh, that, we're, that we're on the horn with right now. now. Now, a day doesn't go by that somebody doesn't ask me that question. Wh when will there be a cure? I stand in front of you, or I guess I technically I'm sitting in front of you very humbly that I don't think that we will see a cure in my lifetime. Now, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. I'm just being very honest with you. And I want to explain why I say that to you. Our understanding of the immune system is, in, is incomplete. We know more about MS and MS neurology and the immune system than ever before, but it's completely inadequate. For example, two years ago, we learned that the brain has a lymphatic draining system. We didn't even know that. For example, there's an entire half of the immune system, the innate immune system, that we're only now being able to manipulate. We're now doing research where we're starting to manipulate the innate immune response. And so I, I don't think, to be blunt, that it's realistic that will cure this complex neuroimmunologic condition um, within my lifetime. But what we can do today, if we play our cards right, is we can make MS really boring. I use an example of another autoimmune condition called diabetes. And diabetes two generations ago was a death sentence. If you had diabetes, you died in 20 years because your kidneys failed. And you may not even know that your girlfriend has diabetes unless you have chocolate cake with her at lunch and say, honey, what are you doing? Oh, I'm taking my insulin. I'm not for a second suggesting it's easy to have diabetes because it's not, but we can make diabetes boring. And now 2021, almost 2022, we can make MS boring in some cases. It's not an easy thing to do, but it is a viable thing to do. And it's my goal in 2021 to help your family live your very best life despite having this condition. It's also my goal that I can keep my patients as healthy as humanly possible with brains as young as humanly possible so that when that becomes available, they are able to receive it. I also wanna to touch on the fact that there's a community of MS neurologists, um, maybe about 10,000 of us worldwide that are absolutely dedicated to that cause. And we are trying, I assure you, to do better. So at my center, we are running five MS clinical trials. And I'm so proud to bring clinical trials to Central Ohio so that people and families impacted by MS can fight back. We're working on it. You know, there's a, a, a sports guy, Yogi Berra, and I don't even know what team he was a coach for because I don't know anything about the foosball, but, but there's a quote that I remember uh, is kicked around, attributed to him. He says, if we keep banging on the door, one day we'll knock it down. So I'm excited about that day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Deb, um, I want to mention that we do have um, hands yeah. raised as well. Yeah. I'm going to go there right now. So... Let's see here. Um, 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 um. Okay, so Caroline has a question. I'm gonna allow you to talk, Caroline. I see kitty cats. You have to unmute yourself, Caroline. Hey, Caroline, how are you? There you go. Caroline, you with us? Hmm. There you go. I think I heard something. <laughs> Caroline, we can't hear you. But you have really cute cats. You have really cute cats. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and mute her again. We can try this another time. If Caroline, I would suggest that you write in your question since we couldn't hear it, but let's go to, will you, dis, will you please discuss, this is from Jen, will you please discuss black holes, how they are formed and how can more be prevented? Absolutely. When, when it's my hope that you have an MRI of your brain and spinal cord, or at least of your brain about once a year, 
And it's my hope that you review it with your neurologist where you see the pictures. I think that it's very important that you see your MRI. And so I actually, um, I, I really feel passionate about sitting with a family and going over their scans with them and comparing last year's to this year's. And when you look at the MRI with your neurologist, you want to be asking about four questions. The first question is, are there any new or bigger white spots? Because if you have a new white spot or a bigger white spot, that's bad. The second question, if they gave you the dye, is do any of the spots light up? Are they contrast enhancing? And if they are, that's bad. The third question is, are there any new dark spots? And the dark spots are uh, very formally called T1 hypointensities, which is doctor talk for a black hole. On the MRI, there's a dark spot. It looks like a hole. And pathologically, it is. It's literally a hole in the brain because the inflammation was so intense that it ate away at the tissue. The way that I think about a black hole, if I use a war analogy, is imagine there's a city where there's a war that rages for three months. And when the dust settles, there's no city left. There's a crater where the city used to be. And that's what happens with the inflammation uh, in MS sometimes, that it's so intense that it literally eats away at the tissues. And I'll tell you something, the darker the hole, the more tissue loss. So a light black hole is less concerning than a dark black hole. Now, MS disease modifying therapies, particularly the new age ones, do a good job at quelling or cleaning up or preventing the accumulation of black holes. And when I look at MRIs with patients, I always want to review whether or not there are black holes and if there are any new ones. Now, I told you there's four things, and that's only three. So in the spirit of being comprehensive, the fourth thing that I want you to ask your neurologist is, do you see accelerated brain volume loss? In other words, is my brain shrinking too fast? And there's ways of measuring that even on a standard community scan. Thank you. Uh, what are the... DMTs that are not able to be to build a proper immune response to COVID, and what would would a second booster help? In that case, so so there are two classes of MS medicines that appear to interfere with COVID nineteen vaccine adoption. the The more severe one are the S one P one receptor modulators, so uh, Gelenia, Zaposia. Ponvoy and Mazent are four drugs that are FDA approved for MS. They're outstanding medicines. They're pills that you take for MS. And they're really good drugs at quelling inflammation and stopping relapses and stuff like that. Unfortunately, they prevent a robust B and T cell response after a COVID vaccine. There's another class of drugs used in MS, uh, one of my faves, and that's B cell depleters. And so these are drugs like Kisempta, Ocrevus, rituxan, these drugs um, deplete your B cells. And that's a really very effective way of treating MS, but it interferes with the COVID vaccine B cell response. If you take a B cell depleter, you mount a COVID T cell response with the vaccine, but you're missing the B cell response, at least in part. And so in those situations, we have to be aware of that and we have to take precautions and we have to weigh the risk benefits. And oftentimes what we're doing is we are absolutely recommending boosters. Now, I'll be transparent on a live uh, webcam tonight and tell you that many of those patients I'm asking to get re-vaccinated an entire three shots. I'm just having them redo it because the more vaccine they see, the more robust response that we have. And there's a lot of recommendations from various international organizations about the timing of vaccines. For example, if you're taking an every six months infusion of a B cell depleter, we think that you don't want to get the B cell depleter and then get your vaccine the next day. It's not going to work very well. But we think that if you wait until month three to four, that's a better time to start your series. So this is works in progress. Um, it's definitely a, a source of frustration for myself and for the families that I take care of. But it's gaming out how to live your best life with MS during a global viral pandemic. Now, real quick, because we're on the topic, I want everyone on the call to be three for three in their fight against COVID. 
right? So I want you to be three for three. And that means number one, I want you to get masked. So I want you to wear a mask when you're not in your house. Number two, I want you to get boosted. I do want you to have a booster. We're talking about mRNA vaccines and we're talking six months later, boy, we want to fire it up. And number three, I want you to get out of the fray. I want you to stay out of the fray. This is not the time to go to big ruckus parties and large gatherings. Uh, we're not done with this, con with this COVID-19 just yet. Thank you. Good suggestions. So Madura says, what is your view on tau patch? I believe that's how it's, um, can you just talk about that? Sure. So, so I don't have any deep knowledge of the tau patch, um, but whenever there's a, a non-conventional therapy and a tau patch is an example of that, I apply three rules and the tau patch violates one of them. So the first rule of a non traditional therapy is it can't be too expensive. And I think a towel patch is pretty darn expensive in my opinion, at least for my family. The second thing is it can't be dangerous. And I don't think putting a sticker on the back of your neck is dangerous. So I'm not worried about that piece. Number three, it can't be instead of something that I know works. So let's pretend that you're independently wealthy and that it's well within your family budget to purchase these towel patches. And you're going to apply them in addition to doing all the stuff that we're working on together. Okay, I'll be excited to hear how it goes and I want to know the results. I'll share with you anecdotally, I haven't had a single patient be excited about the results of their tau patch and they want their money back. Um, that's just my experience in listening to patients talk about uh, their own tau patches. I've never put one on. Thank you. What um, Kathy wants to know what your opinion is on taking zinc oxide, vitamin D, and C for immunity against COVID. First of all, let's celebrate that Kathy just celebrated her 35th year since her diagnosis. So I view Kathy Chester as a friend of mine, although I've never met her to give her a hug. And so, Kathy, this is as close as I'm going to get. I'm going to give you an internet hug. And thank you so much for honoring us by jumping on this live stream. Um, your question is an outstanding question, and many of us want to know what can we do to protect ourselves against viruses and flus, and in specific, this global viral pandemic. Now, Kathy's asking, what about zinc oxide, vitamin D, and vitamin C? Um, I do not think that they are remotely adequate to prevent uh, COVID. They're not dangerous. You can take vitamin C, you can take vitamin D. We give people that all the time. You can take zinc oxide. But I think your very, very best defense, Kathy, is a mask. I think your very best defense is a mask and staying out of the fray as long as being vaccinated. And today with AstraZeneca's new um, exciting monoclonal antibody that may be appropriate for people impacted by MS who are on immunosuppressants and the like. Thank you. Gillian would like to know, how do I know when it's time to change my MS medication and which one to use? Been on the same one since 2013. So I want to keep on keeping on if there, unless there are five things that happen. So, so I want to stay on the, your DMT unless, number one, you have an attack. So if you're on birth control and you get pregnant, it didn't work. The goal of a birth control pill is to prevent an unplanned event, an unplanned pregnancy. And if you're on a disease modifying therapy, which is intended amongst other things to prevent an attack and you have an attack, that's not okay. And so if you're on a DMT with an attack, I think we need to think about that. Number two, if you have new spots on your MRI. And so one of the goals of DMTs is to prevent that from occurring. Number three is if you're failing the litmus test of life. So you're not having an attack and your scans are clean, but you can no longer go to your son's basketball games because you can't navigate from the parking lot into the gymnasium and up the steps. I am not okay with that. You must go to your son's basketball games. Number four, wait a second, we have a problem, Deb. One second. Number four <laughs> um, is if you no longer tolerate your disease-modifying therapy. So there are times where you tolerate the drug and over time you no longer tolerate it. A good example would be jabbing yourself um, with a disease modifying therapy that can get really, really tiring after 10 or 12 years, right? Now, the fourth thing is that the safety profile changes. Um, and my point here is if you are living your very best life despite having MS, you're not withdrawing from the litmus test of life, 
Your exam is not changing. That was the other one. You're not having attacks. You're not having new spots on your MRI and you're tolerating your drug. I'm going to keep on keeping on. But if we see disease activity, whether that be new spots or attacks or failing limitless test of life or your exams getting worse, or if we no longer tolerate the risk profile of the drug, fortunately here in the US, there are 25 different formulations of drugs and we can change it. And so keep that in mind. Great question. Andrew's asked um, that he's diagnosed 13 years ago. He's been on Ocrevus for three years. My symptoms have gotten significantly worse over the past two years, two plus years. My MS doc says Ocrevus is the best med we got and stay on it. She only recommends behavioral changes. Your thoughts? Andrew, I transparently do not have enough information to accurately answer your question. Um, and so I'm not trying to skirt your question. Uh, I, I, I think what I would rather say is you have a right to want better, right? So you're allowed to demand more than good. You're allowed to demand great. And I, I, I think maybe what your doc's saying is I can't guarantee you for a limited time only for $9.99 if you switch drugs that we're going to see a different outcome. But that doesn't mean you're not allowed to ask. And I would go back to your neurologist and say, hey, just humor me. What might we consider if we were going to leave Ocrevus? I don't think that Ocrevus is the best drug. I don't think it's the worst drug. I think it depends on how you're doing. And if you tell me that your exam's gotten worse over the last two years, I'm not very happy with how Ocrevus is treating you. And I think that you're allowed to bring that up to your doctor. Um, it's Again, it's your body and it's your brain and it's your life. It's not hers. And I think you have a right to say, okay, I know that you love this drug, but do you have any other options? And if you don't, can you refer me to someone that might be able to talk to me about some other things that we might consider together? That was great. Good answer. Um, Mary says she'd like you to explain why Tysabri isn't for SPMS, although it's considered a relapsing form. I am SPMS and am on Tysabri. Two neurologists have told me they won't put that label on me because then insurance um, won't cover it. Yeah. Well, so, so you're touching on um, the politics uh, and culture of medicine um, more than you are on the science of medicine, which is very, very relevant. And I thank you for asking that question. First of all, Tysabri works in SPMS, period. There's a trial called the ASCEND trial, which studied Tysabri and SPMS. And at first blush, it failed because we didn't ask the right question. We were looking at walking speed, dumb thing to look at, sorry. And so what we found was if you're on Tysabri with SPMS, we maintain hand function. We preserve the neurologic reserve of your upper extremity and that's beautiful. And so Tysabri does work in SPMS and we've proven it. Not to the satisfaction of the American FDA, but doesn't change the truth, it really does work. Now you touch on another point, which is the concept of SPMS. And SPMS is not the equivalent of stage four cancer, but it's misunderstood. And unfortunately, many payers and providers assume incorrectly that if you have SPMS, the old drugs don't work and that's simply false. Now you mentioned that two neurologists didn't wanna label you with SPMS and that's probably in an attempt and making sure they can keep you on your drug. They don't wanna say the wrong words and have some silly insurance company say, well, in that case, I won't give it to you anymore. Um, and so I, I do want to encourage you that you're on something really fantastic and it, it has been demonstrated to help. And I love that. And I would keep on keeping on. Thank you for the question. Ocrevus is supposed to be given every six months. My doctor has been monitoring my B-cell count via CD quantification and delaying my next treatment until it starts to rise or I have a relapse. Have you heard of this and do you have an opinion? Oof. Oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive my cough there. Yeah, I have heard of that and I vehemently disagree. So, so I tried to play that game when I was a young man, um, a, a new do doctor right out of fellowship and I thought I was brilliant. And this was with rituximab, because back then we didn't have Ocrevus, but rituximab is a B-cell depleter, very similar to Ocrevus. And I thought, haha, I will wait until your CD19 count crests zero, and then I'll know it's time to give you your next dose. And what I learned, I'm very humbled to share, 
was that I allowed people to have breakthrough disease because when the CD19 count goes above zero, in other words, when the B cells come back, the horse is out of the barn, it's too late. And so I disagree vehemently with that decision. I think it puts you at grave risk. Moreover, in the real world, you don't make a decision to start Ocrevus and take it that day. You make a decision to start Ocrevus and you start a month or three later. And so at the time that you have an attack, it's too late. You just suffered brain damage. At the time that your B cells have come back, it's too late. Your immune system is reactivated. And so it is my strong goal when using a B cell depleter to keep the B cells depleted. Okay. Um, Lanya says, I've had pain management doctors who told me I didn't hurt when I had TN and Lermites. Yes, thank you. So, so um, you are a you expert. And just because somebody went to medical school doesn't make them uh, a magician or a wizard. They can't see inside of your body. They just read books you didn't read, which does not make them more experienced at your body than you are. And if your face hurts, it hurts, period. If when you bend your neck down, you have electricity that runs down your back, that's probably real. And I apologize on behalf of doctors for telling you something that is simply not true. Yes, you do hurt. Um, and just because they don't understand it doesn't mean it's not real. Many times we talk about the invisible nature of MS and honey, you look so good. Well, they don't look ill-informed or ignorant and yet they are, and I'm sorry. Okay, Kathy would like to know, also, are there any wide studies that were done or are being on aging and MS, how MS affects people after years of having it? She realizes we're all different, but just a general answer. Um, also, I'm tired of hearing for years that typically we'll live seven years less than people without MS. Thanks again, Kathy. Absolutely, Kathy. So that's a pretty packed question. Let's unpack it just a little bit. So the, the comment that people impacted by MS die early comes from an era pre-medicine. And it's my strong belief that with the earliest application of the most effective medicine you're comfortable with, and by continuing that, we can delay or slow down that phenomenon. Um, it's my opinion that in the modern era with modern medicines, we demand that your life expectancy is that of the general population, period. So I think that's a really good point that you bring up. Now, there is an investigation looking at withdrawing care. There's actually several different investigations, including some very high profile grants, PCORI grants um, and whatnot that are looking at this question. And so I do think that we will have a readout in the next couple of years. Um, literally, like probably four or five years, we're going to have a, a more granular answer. So stay tuned and we'll, uh, we'll talk again very soon, I hope. Anne's asking that her... MS specialist says new symptoms or reoccurring old symptoms are not relapses, but just symptoms of MS. He says it has to do more with the way you are uh, walking. In five years, I have been treated for a relapse one time and I demanded it. How do you explain relapses? So a relapse, a flare, an exacerbation, an attack, it's all the same thing. It's when you were cool in the gang for at least a month, no fever, nothing going on. And then you have a new neurological deficit. And I'll use an optic neuritis as a classic example. So over three days, your eye hurts more and more when you move it and it goes blurry and you really can't see very well. And you have an optic neuritis and with some steroids and time, the inflammation dies down and you regain some or all of your vision back. So that's an attack. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm inferring some of your conversation. And so if I'm off base, please uh, accept my apology. But I think what your doctor might be saying is something to the effect of an attack is noise on top of a progressive uh, disease process. And that is an opinion of some MS neurologists um, around the world. I am of the opinion that an attack is inflammation in a spot I don't want it, your brain or spinal cord. 
and unchecked inflammation is not good for you. So I'm actually rather different uh, in my approach. I treat almost anything that I think is an attack with steroids. I even treat new spots on the MRI. If you have an enhancing lesion, I'll give you steroids for it because I want to quell the inflammation. Now, that doesn't make me right. It just makes me really opinionated. And it's there are risks to steroids, yes. But I know that the I, I know that left unchecked, we could burn a hole in your brain and you could have a black hole where you used to have brain tissue. And I don't want that for you. So so I I think that I want to commend you on demanding steroids the time that you did. And again, if there's a theme to my comments tonight is that it's your body and you're allowed to say, excuse me, a well-intended doctor person. I would like to hasten the recovery of the loss of feeling in my hand. I would like to put up with the side effects of steroids. And I think it's your obligation to hook me up. So do so. Paula? Has, I, this is a very general question, and maybe you can touch on your thoughts, but she'd like to know mental health in MS. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so, so people impacted by MS are double at risk to develop depression compared to the general population, which is saying something. People impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience anxiety compared to the general population. Now, if you think about the statistics for a second, there is a global viral pandemic. It's been going on for two years. But what is less often discussed is that in the same breath, there is a global mental health crisis. Many of the community tools that we use to get through our day were ripped away from us. For example, me going to the gymnasium, can't do that. And we find ourselves agoraphobic, fearful of going outside and with increased anxiety. I'll tell you that in my own MS practice, caring for maybe 1, 1,500 families, I have had to up my game in psychiatry more than any other area of medicine these past two years. I have read more, more medical information about psychiatry than any other field because I can't get my patients into a psychiatrist. So I am now mixing lotions and potions and doubling medicines and doing all kinds of things to try to get you okay. Mental health is very, very important. And if you have never heard the, the name Dr. Amy Sullivan, then I'm excited I get to share her name with you. Dr. Amy Sullivan is a good friend of mine. She lives in Cleveland, uh, just two hours north of me. She works at a very small place. You may have not have heard of it before. It's called the Cleveland Clinic. And, and she's in charge of their behavioral health. Uh, and she is a wizard. I, I really think she does God's work. Um, and, and she has a very beautiful program uh, for her patients. And you can check it out by, by checking out what she does uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. Mental health is a critical aspect to MS. And I want to share one startling statistic with you. Untreated depression results in worsening neurological status in MS. So it's not just important to treat depression because it's a really good idea. It's also important because it actually has an impact on your neurological status over, over, over time. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. That was a great answer. Oh, thank you. That was a great answer. Um, Joe is asking, is the location of the lesion directly a direct link to a particular disability? Hey, Joe, I hope you and your family are doing well. Um, and the answer is sometimes, right? That's a great answer for me. <laughs> so, so in neurology school, we spend literally years training ourselves. So if you tell me these three symptoms, I can tell you exactly where in the brain within like a millimeter that uh, damage occurs. Or if you show me some damage, I can tell you what symptoms you should see in a stroke. And MS thinks that's hilarious and doesn't abide by those rules. The reason, Joe, is because when you have a, um, a new lesion in an MS brain, it's inflamed. It's not tissue death right away like with a stroke. It's, in, it's inflammation and the brain rewires around it. And so you may not lose a function, you may still have the function, but your brain is doing way more work to get the job done. Now, there are situations, for example, the optic nerve, if the left optic nerve gets hit, you ain't gonna see so hot. 
and the spinal cord, if a certain part of the spinal cord gets hit, and I can tell you, oh, we're probably going to see this problem in your legs. But the vast majority of the lesions in the top of the brain go unnoticed and do not have a direct correlate. I'll tell you, if you think about it this way, if you have a bunch of lesions, your brain is constantly rewiring and it's doing a lot more work to get the job done. That's the underpinnings of fatigue in MS. So let's pretend that Deb and I went on a walk. Now I would like to take the walk in Florida where she is because up here it's kind of cold. And I'm going to fly down to visit her on Southwest and I'm going to bring two cement blocks and I'm going to sneak them on her shoelaces before we start walking. And we're going to go for a stroll in the Florida sun, commenting on how gorgeous it is where she lives and not where I live. And she's going to keep pace with me the whole time we're walking. At the end of the walk, I am refreshed and she is exhausted because she's been dragging cement blocks behind her, keeping up with me the whole time. And Joe, that is exactly what's happening when you're using your noggin to, can, to perform cognitive tasks with MS because your brain's working overtime to overcome all the lesions. Wonderful, thank you. How, uh, ben wants to know, how often should someone with PPMS on Ocrevus get tested for the JC virus? I would do that never because Ocrevus has no bearing on the JC virus. There's been over 200,000 human beings that have taken Ocrevus in one case of PML in a 78 year old who had independent risk factors for PML. Doctors put people on Ocrevus to avoid a Tysabri PML risk. And so in you, I would never check a JC virus ever. Okay, Caroline wants to know, is Jelenia a therapy that can be taken long-term? She understands there's, um, there are relapses that occur when people go off of this DMT. Two very important points that Caroline's bringing up. First of all, how long do you take a medicine? So I take a medicine for life unless one of those five things happen. So if you're on Jelenia not having attacks, not having new spots, your exam's not worsening, you're not failing the litmus test of life, and you're tolerating the safety profile, I don't want to stop your Jelenia. And Jelenia was invented to take forever. Now, the second piece is we have learned that rarely when you stop Jelenia cold turkey with no follow-up, you can have a rebound of your MS where you have like a massive attack and it's really ugly. But the simple way of managing that is not to stop cold turkey without a follow-up plan. So any MS neurologist worth her salt will tell you a plan, say, we're going to stop Jelenia, then we're going to do these things, and then we're going to do these things, and then we're going to get you on this. And the things in the middle are geared towards protecting you to help you get off the drug. I do not think it's hard to get off Jelenia. We just have to be planful. Doctor, we have quite a few questions that so we may not be able to get to all of them, but would you be willing to stay a few extra minutes? Do you have that time? I would be happy to stay a few extra minutes, and I would also be happy to come back on at your invitation and finish up the question sometime in the near future. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. So Amy said that her daughter was diagnosed with MS at 14 years old, which she's now 17. Um, they were told to expect to see cure in her lifetime. I hope since she's just a teen that this will actually be a reality. People are always surprised to learn that um, kids get MS too. I'm curious, does Dr. Boster treat kids and teens with MS? So thank you for sharing that. Um, I absolutely do treat anyone with MS of any age. And so I, I take care of pediatric MS patients and I take care of teenagers with MS. And I'm actually very excited to share with you that we are participating in a clinical trial for children right now. There's a clinical trial where we're comparing two different MS drugs, no placebo. So kids with relapsing MS will be randomly assigned to take Jelenia or Ocrevus. And the trial's created so you don't know which one you're on because you're doing both. One's real, one's fake. And the other side, the other one's real, the other one's fake. And it's, it's really, really exciting to be able to participate in that kind of trial because kids are not little adults, they're different and we have to treat them as such. And so it's such an honor to be able to participate in such a trial to try to help bring something to market to help children with MS. Wonderful. You know, we, in, our, in our, one of our last MS Focus magazines, we highlighted pediatric MS and we had a doctor speak on that. And we also had parents as a panel 
um, speak about what it's like to live with their children as caregivers to their children and that have MS. And it was a fabulous, fabulous uh, panel. That's and awesome. All of, those, all of those things are accessible after because on our YouTube channel, just like yours will be, you can look at those panels. So Amy, um, I, I would look at that and, and hopefully you'll benefit by that. So Jules asked, because Simta and Ocrevus seem like very similar as drugs, which would you suggest if someone's looking at both for next DMT? I, I agree with you that they're both high efficacy drugs. I agree with you that they're both very, very exciting. And if you're flipping a coin, picking between Kasemta and Ocrevus, you're making a really good choice. Or if you're throwing a dart at a dartboard and it hits one of those two words, consider yourself fortunate. It really gets down to the nitty gritty. Uh, of uh, the way that you receive the medicine, you send and, um, very simple infusion done twice a year. It's only two and a half hours. So that means that 360, uh, three days out of the year, you do you. Kisemta is a shot that you give yourself once a month. And so it's in the comfort of your own home. And so there are pluses and minuses about both of those. And I would submit to you that there isn't one size fits all, that some patients are going to gravitate towards a twice annual infusion with their doctor's visits. Other patients are going to gravitate to a self-injection. And I'm just delighted that both are so darn good. Jen has said, I take baclofen for spasticity, Zoloft and Xanax for depression and anxiety. Another MSR that I know takes Valium for spasticity. Is that contraindicated with what I currently take? So nowhere near enough information to be able to answer your question. Um, what you're sharing is that there isn't a recipe book and there's a lot of different ways of treating chronic symptoms. There's lots of different combinations of lotions and potions, and that's part of the, the art of medicine. I, for example, do not use Valium to treat spasticity. I manage a lot of high uh, level spasticity. I don't, I don't personally like to do that because of the sedation and the abuse and addiction potential and dependence potential associated with Valium, but it is an effective way of doing it. So but that's not my style. Now, does that mean that a neurologist that uses Valium is bad? Absolutely not. It is an effective way. And I remember a long time ago, a friend of mine who is a spasticity doctor said, isn't it cool? There's so many different ways to make this better. And he was spot on. Absolutely. I think there's so many different variables that we need to consider. And unfortunately, there's not enough information there for me really to dig in. And I know you touched on this, but I, it was so important what you had said that I'd like you to help Ginger in this, but Ginger was just recently diagnosed with MS and she was told that there's no treatment plan for her because of her age. So, -uh. so, so that's not true. So there is a treatment plan and there's a treatment plan that involves behavioral changes and dietary changes and lifestyle changes and exercise changes and medicines. There are medicines to help you. And I don't care how old you are, Ginger. Um, I stopped treating after death and before death, there's a host of medicines that I've had great success in using. And so um, what the doctor said is simply not true. Um, and fortunately, like plumbers, there's lots of doctors out there. And so you can see a different one of us. And we're going to make this our last one and we will take you up on that offer to do this again in the future. So thank you. Um, Madura says, how do you improve the cognition or memory? Carrying out sequential dilutions in chemistry is a difficult, it's difficult with MS. I had to stop my PhD because of MS. So cognitive impairment is common in MS. Upwards of 70% of people impacted by MS can develop some difficulties with thinking and memory. Now, this is not an Alzheimer's dementia or anything like that. Most often, it's a problem with executive functioning in the front of your head multitasking, working under time constraints, trying to keep multiple things uh, in your head juggling at one time, those can be very, very challenging. And there are a host of ways to treat it. Um, I have a YouTube channel and on my YouTube channel, I have an entire playlist with 20 plus videos on different tricks and tips to treat cognition. But in the interest of talking tonight, let's just come up with five because I have five fingers on this hand. So one of them is gonna be to avoid polypharmacy. So the average person with MS is on seven drugs, and that's probably three or four too many. 
And so every time your doctor asks to add a drug, say, which drug are you removing? And every time you see your doctor, say, which drugs can we reduce? Are there any that we can cut in half? That's, that should be a constant and ever ongoing conversation to try to reduce the number of medicines that you're on. Number two, exercising as part of your lifestyle improves brain volume, slows brain volume loss, and improves outcomes of thinking and memory. Number three, treating depression, because untreated depression worsens thinking and memory. There's a fancy term called pseudo-dementia. And if you treat the mood, the thinking literally improves. Number four, treating fatigue, because fatigue is also we use for fatigue and work. And number five, I want you to take the most effective DMT that you're comfortable with because the high efficacy DMTs have been shown to decrease cognitive impairment. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sticking with us even longer than we have committed to for tonight. My absolute pleasure, Deb. Um, uh, I, I adore your organization. I think literally you do God's work. I am so happy to get to participate and I look forward to being invited back so we can do this again very soon. Wonderful. So folks, that's all the time we have for now. If you've missed any part of this conference, it'll be available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page. You can access that from our website, msfocus.org, or our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference will be Tuesday, December 14th at 3.30 p.m. That's Eastern time. And we're going to be featuring, featuring Dr. Thrower. Dr. Ben Thrower every year does an MS holiday trivia with us. So we used to do it live with him. Now he's doing it via Zoom. So it's a lot of fun. If you haven't, if you haven't had the pleasure of seeing my friend, Dr. Thrower present, you are in for one heck of a treat. He's a dynamo. So I'm probably going to turn in to watch my friend Ben perform because it's awesome. He is. He's pretty darn awesome. Um, so our sincere thanks go to all of our attendees for your participation and especially Dr. Boster, who was kind enough to not only come to us today, but stay longer and take time out of his schedule with his family. I'm sure they're waiting for you. The last time you said I, I can wife. smell I can smell the dinner. So. <laughs> <laughs> I remember God you bless. saying that one time that until your wife pulled you away. <laughs> God bless. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you Goodbye, so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. We'll see you next time.